Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about event-based API patterns and practices. My name is James Higginbotham. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm an API architect. I focus on working with enterprises and software as a service companies on their API strategy and execution as well as coaching individual teams on how to design uh, effective APIs as part of the overall API surface area or API portfolio in the organization. Um, my background is uh, pretty varied. I've worked in a variety of different vertical industries, uh, including commercial insurance, healthcare, hospitality, finance and banking, travel, and even helping to get a startup airline off the ground, literally. Uh, so I always like to start my talks off by reminding ourselves that API design is really an architectural concern. It applies architectural principles and uh, it combines the insights we have from business, product design, and software engineering. And with all, without all three aspects involved in the process, uh, we'll build APIs that uh, really don't meet the needs of our stakeholders. So we know today's popular API styles for synchronous APIs include REST and GraphQL and gRPC. And we're also starting to see the emergence of a lot of asynchronous APIs. These asynchronous APIs help us to typically share events, but other kinds of messages as well. And they oftentimes answer questions like what happened, who did this happen to, and why did it occur? Uh, much different than our request response APIs that we designed today. Uh, it might include things like uh, events when someone subscribes or unsubscribes from a newsletter. Or it could include commit records of when some particular person or a bot made a change to some code and issued a pull request. Whatever those events are, we want to take interest in them by subscribing to them and then reacting to them and, and taking action that wasn't previously designed into the system of record that emitted the event. In the past, we've had two primary options, API polling and now API eventing. Polling is where we spend time checking an API and making requests to see if the data has changed. So we constantly make requests to an API, see if the data has changed in some significant way, and if so, then infer the event that occurred. Long polling is a secondary version of that where we stay connected to a server for a longer period of time, hopefully allowing the server to send us some sort of update or uh, allowing us to constantly check but not having to make new connections. Now we're seeing things where server push is more heavily involved than in the past. Instead of asking for new data or checking to see if there's new updates, we get notified whenever those updates occur. Uh, this may sound familiar, those of you that have been working in event-driven architectures or using message brokers in the past are probably familiar with this. And we have two key concepts that we bring from that world into our async APIs. Uh, the first are queues. Those are point-to-point -point messages where we send a message from one particular component to the broker, say message A, and it goes to a component uh, on the other side of the broker, someone that component on the left doesn't know about. It just knows that it sent the message and it lets the broker figure out where that message needs to go. We send a second message from the component on the left to the message broker and the message broker decides what component it should go to. Perhaps a different component subscribed to the same thing. Compare that to topics or the fan out or pub sub pattern where when we send a, a message, when we send a message, message A from the publisher, uh, it gets sent to the broker and the broker sends it to every subscriber that's interested so everyone gets a copy of it. So we have one where we can distribute messages and work on a single queue and, and typically have once and only once delivery whenever possible de depending on the configuration and design of the message broker to one that allows us to broadcast an event to any number of subscribers. We've now seen the use of distributed logs as an alternative way to message brokers to be able to broadcast events or messages or data state changes. In this case, we have distributed logs that live within a topic. We have message records that are appended, but never modified. And then we have consumers that can walk either from the very beginning of the first record that we have or the latest record that's published and react to that. Slightly different approach to that that's offered by Apache Kafka and Apache Pulsar. And now we're seeing some combinations, particularly in Apache Pulsar, where the idea of queues and topics and distributed logs are being merged together and giving you the flexibility you need to handle the events the way you need them. All that said, we now have an emergence of 
HTTP and non HTTP styles of eventing that are starting to crop up. And this is creating this category of async API styles that are complementary to our existing synchronous REST based, GraphQL based, and gRPC based uh, API styles that we've been using today. One of the most popular and one of the ones that have been around the longest is webhooks. Webhooks allow us to make a server to server communication possible where a server that, it, that has, let's say, an API that makes changes to data can now broadcast an HTTP POST request back to any number of subscribers that are interested in being notified. What that means is the subscriber needs to be a server into itself. It needs to be able to stand up an, uh, a POST-based URL and receive notifications on that endpoint. Uh, therefore, we don't use this for things like web browsers. Uh, one really good example is using things like uh, Cisco Teams and their web, uh, WebEx Teams and their webhooks, as well as Slack-based real-time uh, notifications via their webhooks. And we can even combine them, not just in unidirectional from the server where the state data changed to the subscriber, but we can also have bidirectional communication. So let's say if we're doing a workflow, we might have someone who's asking for a review within a messaging app. That messaging app then broadcasts that message to a webhook dispatcher that then makes an HTTP post call to some other subscriber uh, elsewhere outside of its own data center. That webhook receiver receives that message via the HTTP post, can pass that message on to a workflow engine, can then surface that to some sort of user interface to allow someone to approve a particular request, that approval's been noted in the workflow engine, then dispatches via a separate webhook to any interested subscribers that want to know when the uh, particular request has been approved or declined and the state has changed. We broadcast that back to another receiver and perhaps then integrate that back into either the originating system or some other third system as part of the equation. So we can use webhooks to communicate back and forth between systems using post requests whenever some data change has occurred or some sort of significant event has been raised. We've also seen uh, a few instances where server sent events help us to bridge these kinds of events into the browser. The server sent events allow a, a browser or any kind of API client to connect to a specific endpoint via a GET request. They mention that uh, they want the content type of an event stream. We use a keep alive connection in HTTP 1.1. We don't cache the requests and we can even pass in an optional last event ID that we've seen to recover when we've been offline for a while. We then start having ser the server push events, whether they're JSON, plain text, or some other uh, event data to an event channel. And that allows the client then to filter out and and process events that it's received that it may be interested in. Just bear in mind that server set events are only from server to client. So once the client makes the connection to the server and engages in an SSE session, uh, it's only gonna receive events from the server back. It will never be able to talk back to the server again unless it makes a separate connection. But it's really useful if we just need simple server push. Web sockets are very similar, but they're bi-directional. They allow us to tunnel through HTTP any kind of sub protocol that we design. That sub protocol then could be plain text, it could be SOAP based API calls or any sort of other type of sub protocol that we decide we need. That web sockets allow for bi-directional communication so the client can send data as well as a server and it allows them to have bi-directional communication throughout the session. So really, really powerful and useful, but we uh, have a little bit more complexity because we have sub protocols in place. GraphQL has the idea of subscriptions where we can define a subscription of something we're interested in and any kind of event that occurs based on that subscription detail will cause uh, messages to be streamed back to us over HTTP, allowing mobile and web clients as well as servers to be notified when new data exists or data has been changed or any other kind of event has been surfaced. gRPC has bi-directional streaming support. It allows us to define a service operation that uh, either uh, accepts an incoming stream or emits an outgoing stream or both. And that allows us to use uh, over HTTP2 uh, bi-directional communication underneath the covers, communicating between client and server. Really, really popular for microservices that are built with gRPC and need to be able to communicate back and forth. With that said, in all those protocols, we do have to spend some time designing 
our API. So I want to dive into uh, design patterns now that we've had kind of a quick look at the different protocols that are out there and the ways that we can embed messages over HTTP. I love this quote from Tim Bray from 2019 in November. If you're going to start emitting events from a piece of software, put just as much care into the event design uh, as you would uh, specifying an API because event formats are a contract too. And it's important to understand that. I see a lot of organizations designing events ad hoc and the only definition of that event exists inside their code. If someone else wants to subscribe to that event, they have to crack open some code and figure it out. That works fine if we're all available uh, within the same organization and we all have the same kind of access, at least read only to the code base, we can review it. But if we're outside the organization, that's not much use at all. So we need to really start thinking about the contracts that we design in our events and make sure that we don't break those downstream event consumers that may be depending on some events that we designed really quickly on a Friday afternoon to get some piece of software working. Uh, as we know, the Async API allows us to capture and discover these types of events and is a really great way of doing this. Within our Async API, we're going to be defining our message formats, and those message formats are the ones that we're really uh, going to be capturing applying these design patterns to. The first design pattern that I want to talk about is thin event notification. This is where we really only broadcast the necessary details about when an event occurred. Uh, this oftentimes forces subscribers to go reach out to some sort of request response API to fetch additional details to be able to complete the necessary logic in reacting to the event. Uh, we want to use this kind of event when we want subscribers to make sure they have the most current data. If we send all of the data at once on this event, but the data could have been changed by multiple uh, API consumers making changes to the data, web apps, mobile apps, and so on, and we don't want that event processing to operate on stale data, the best way to do that is to send just enough information for that consumer to determine if they're interested in the event, if they want to act on it, and then have them subsequently make API calls to fetch the latest version of that data for processing. Building upon that, uh, design pattern number two encourages the use of hypermedia-driven events. Uh, just like our REST APIs that allow us to um, process or include links for clients to be able to make subsequent processes or requests for related data or to conduct workflow-driven development uh, and, and processing of our API or interaction with our API, uh, hypermedia links and event payloads can help those that are using thin events to know exactly where to go to get that data. This is really, really popular when we have dynamic backend data sources. Perhaps the event may have come from a system of record, uh, one of several, and we don't know which one we should be talking to to go fetch that data. In the case of a hypermedia-driven thin event, we can embed the links to know how to, to tell the client or the event subscriber how to go fetch that data and then subsequently how to process it. So this lets us bridge our request response synchronous APIs with the world of async APIs and connect them together. So it's very, very easy to subscribe to an event and then know where to get the data from. Really powerful. The third design pattern is event carried state transfer. Event carried state transfer is really the opposite of a thin event. It's when we broadcast all of the known data at the time of the event, allowing the consumer never have to go reach into that source system and fetch the additional data that they may need to conduct their work. Every bit of data that they may need, an entire snapshot of the data that's been changed uh, or the event that has occurred is included in the event payload. This is really important when subscribers want a snapshot so they don't have to call back to the API. It reduces load on the, the, the synchronous APIs. Uh, it also allows us to share data state changes and then aggregate those changes over time. Very similar to uh, event sourcing and CQRS style of patterns. Uh, it's very common in message streaming solutions like Apache Kafka and Pulsar where we want to capture all the data at the time of the event, keep that as a snapshot, so that even if the data changes in the system of record, we have a snapshot of the exact state of the data at that point in time of the event. Design pattern number four uh, includes structured event payloads. When we're designing our event payloads, it's oftentimes uh, a preference to create more of a flat event structure where all the fields are at the top level. 
But when we uh, start to add new events or new data structures or we have names that collide, we could have some, some problems with the event payloads and it makes the event payloads harder to understand, harder to consume, harder to write that subscri subscriber integration code. So in that case, we wanna have uh, properties uh, that are grouped together based on nested structures rather than flat structures. It allows us to group things like address structures and contact or profile details and other things together. And it allows us to use the same field names and apply some level of context to them. So looking at this example on the right, imagine that we were uh, managing a contact profile with two billing addresses. If we had them all flattened, we might have contact first name, contact last name, contact email, billing address line one, billing address line two. It makes it a lot more difficult to reuse structures on the consumer side and to be able to parse that payload uh, and apply validation rules if they're all flat and we have to repeat the code that's used to enumerate through billing address, address line one, and billing address, address line two versus the mailing address, line one and line two. So grouping them in this way allows us to create these structs. We might create a struct on the consumer side called address. We parse out the payload. We assign the billing information to one instance of the address struct and mailing to another, and then we can perform validation or any kind of logic that we need. So if we have complex data structures, consider nesting structures into related data. It allows us to have um, one to many nested children inside of our event payload structures uh, to represent the relationships that exist on the back end that we want to convey to our consumers. And it also allows us to evolve our payloads over time because we can add new top level property names with nested structures that will offer the contextual semantics for the subscriber to make sure they understand how to process that payload efficiently and effectively. The fifth design pattern is evolution event schema. So we wanna keep in mind when we design our event schemas that we ap uh, apply some non-breaking changes. This goes back to Tim Bray's quote about making sure that we design our event APIs to withstand evolutionary design changes and, uh, and making sure that we communicate that with everyone that's using uh, consuming the API at the time or consuming, consuming events at the time. So in this case, uh, we wanna make sure that we only add new properties that have default values or that are not required. So that if we're going back and processing aggregated events that we have some default values that can be applied retroactively. We don't ex delete existing processes, or we don't delete existing properties unless they offer a default value. So if those properties are missing in the future, we can rely on a default value for that consumer to be able to, to use for that field value and that we don't rename property names. A lot of these things are documented well when it comes to Avro schema definitions for Apache Kafka and those things should be heeded carefully. We have to keep in mind that some of our events, particularly those that are stored in a distributed log and may be revisited back to time zero where we didn't have certain fields, they're gonna need those values to be able to aggregate or default values that they can depend on. So it's, it's almost uh, similar to the way that we design non-breaking changes and request response APIs. The difference is these events may be laying around for a long period of time. They rep may represent an event that happened uh, a day ago, an hour ago, a minute ago, or it could even be weeks or months ago or years ago, uh, depending on how long our retention period is for our events. So we need to think about what would a consumer today do with an event previously uh, emitted, let's say weeks ago, before we added a new property. Is there a default value that can be applied? How do we do that? And each consumer needs to know how to do that. We can't just put that in the documentation. We need to think about what that means to the schema and what that means to any consumers moving forward. So when you think about event payload changes, apply some evolutionary event schema patterns make sure that you avoid breaking changes and that you make it easy for people to go back to historical events as well as deal with future events when the schema has changed. Design pattern number six includes the uh, support for offline and error, error recovery support. So when we think about our consumers, it's very easy to think about the happy path. The fact that our consumers uh, or our subscribers are receiving events from our async APIs all the time. But what it doesn't do is think about people that go offline. What happens if the code's been updated and there's a bug in it? Or a data center goes offline for a period of time and we have some events stacking up that haven't been processed? 
How do we come back and reconnect with our async APIs and recover from where we left off? Uh, server sent events are great for that because we can specify the last event message we've seen and the server could then start sending messages that you've missed. This may include also durability on the server side, keeping track of events that have been sent to a particular subscriber that's offline so that when they come back online, we can push those down and let them get caught up. It may also include APIs that let us catch up separately. Maybe a Git API that we pass it the message ID that we last saw and it can send us everything that it knows before we start receiving the latest event messages. Uh, in the case of this example here, GitHub is offering uh, a web API that allows us to see every webhook and whether it's successfully delivered or not and allows us to help us troubleshoot as well if our systems go offline without realizing it or are stumbling over the processing of an event and throwing errors and GitHub is or catching those errors and logging them. So make sure you keep in mind consumers that uh, have limited or no access to internal mechanisms, how you're going to automate these processes just so that not only do you have a web interface to allow you to see delivery failures, but there's an automated way for a system when it restarts to recover. Make sure you build that in either through synchronous request response APIs using our REST patterns that we already have in place or using protocol level recovery options. Uh, design pattern number seven, we need to separate our internal and external events. And this is really, really important. Uh, when I see teams designing uh, different kinds of events, I see them oftentimes taking their internal events and directly pushing them over webhooks or SSE. And while that might be useful for an internal service to service communication to see those internal events, we don't want to expose a lot of internal details to our external consumers. They should not know the internal details of how we built things, nor should they be dependent upon our internal messaging structures that we use to coordinate our internal services. Services change, they split, they merge, they go away, and sometimes that might have an impact on our external event consumers if we share the same kind of event. So we want to make sure that our internal events for coordinating implementation details are separate from our external events that we want to use to notify or allow other systems to extend what we do when we have events that occur. So think about uh, a payment processing solution where when we talk to our payment processor, we may get some information back like you see on the top here, the transaction ID, the authorization server, merchant IDs, all kinds of additional details about how we integrate it in with the payment processing gateway. That information may not be very useful to someone who just wants to know if an order's payment was processed or not. They don't need to know what the merchant ID uh, is. They don't need to know necessarily what authorization server this request was routed to on the back end of your payment gateway. Instead, they just need to know that it was processed, processed successfully. So differentiate your internal events from your external events and also consider how much data you're leaking if you leak internal events out to your external consumers. Details internally could be used maliciously by people that might get a hold of that event data at some point. All of that to say that when we design our API, asynchronous API event structures, we need to think about the jobs to be done. What is it that people are doing? Uh, we have a lot of messaging platforms today that allow us to interact uh, between one another and chat with one another, and now we're starting to see workflows emerge inside of there. So those workflows allow these bots to be able to query APIs and use hypermedia links to determine what options are available and surface those to the end user for uh, direct interaction with a human. Once that's done, it generates an event that tells us what happened or what the human, what that person decided to do as a result of that bot bringing to their attention some sort of decision that needed to be made. So when we think about that, we don't wanna think about all the internal decisions and service structures that we have. We wanna think about instead the type of events that occur as a result of those interaction points. All this leads us to the evolving enterprise platform. We have APIs today that deliver capabilities through commands and queries, our gets, our posts, our puts, our deletes, and we have events and streaming that are now offering extensibility of our API platform with our various async API protocols that we talked about earlier. We can then combine that with the open API spec and the async API specs to make discovery of request response synchronous APIs as well as asynchronous events and streams available to us. 
This is really driving a lot of the innovation that's occurring within enterprises and SaaS companies today between uh, their customers and their internal workforce and their internal systems. We have APIs that uh, may be decomposed into services and those services emit events and streams and those event and stream, events and streams can then be subscribed to either remotely over HTTP or internally via functions as a service, stream processing code, other services that react to those events. So we're seeing this really robust API platform that's starting to emerge and it's really, really exciting to see all this happening. And async APIs are going to be just yet another way to extend the reach of our API platforms and products that we offer today. Uh, that's all for me. Uh, if we have any remaining questions, I'll be around to be able to answer them. Thank you very much for your